started. Um, so today we're basically going to look at the <clears throat> some of the, the standards or Adam is going to tell us about the standards that are on update, but just back, going back into history, um, general anesthesia was introduced or started in 1849. And, but then in 1949, um, Robert McIntosh challenged the view that um, initially people always thought that anesthesia deaths were inevitable. There was no reason to look through whether there was an aspect to safety, but he challenged them and found that there were actually um, deaths that were avoidable. And over time, we've seen different guidelines coming in. We've seen different foundations coming in to try and um, look at safety during practice of anesthesia. And this year, we've had a new slogan or a new term about staying home and staying safe. I don't know whether Adam today is going to also tell us how we can have a safe practice, practice of anesthesia from home, given that we have COVID. So let's um, in the next few minutes let's let's make welcome and listen to Dr. Adam Smith from the East, where the wise men come from. Thanks very much, uh, Rachel. Good evening, everybody. Um, have the wise men always come from the East? Um, Let's hope so. So, uh, unfortunately, yes. I'm, I wanted to avoid <laughs> talking about uh, COVID, so I, I, I'm not going to mention the word again. Uh, this is just about anesthesia and safety. So, uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm an honorary lecturer in Bustim University, Faculty of Health Sciences, uh, and I also work as a, a medical officer special grade in the Bali Regional Hospital. Uh, as is traditional, I'm, I'm going to just start with, uh, well, I don't really have what I say are my own opinions, uh, and I hold no position at the WFSA, but I do support uh, and agree with the standards. And so the standards that I'm going to spend most of my time talking about were published in 2018. Um, and are endorsed by the WHO and the WFSA at the end of the slide. But before we begin talking specifically about the standards, I want to ask ourselves, uh, is anesthesia now safe? And you could argue, if you look at this review that was published in 2012 by Bainbridge, uh, that, that an anesthesia is much, much safer now compared to before. This graph uh, looks at all the studies that have uh, that have reported anaesthetic related mortality in both developed and developing countries and the size of the bubble represents the the number of patients that are involved in the study and you can see that there's been a, a good trend downwards between 1939 and 2009 but if you look a little bit more closely that reduction in anesthesia related mortality uh, is mainly in high income countries. And so the event rate in this study remained three times higher in low human development index countries compared to uh, high income countries. So with that in mind, let me just tell you a story about uh, a patient. So Maureen were, is 26 uh, and she's been fit and healthy in the past. She's never had any medical problems. Uh, but she's developed some hemorrhoids and so she is coming into hospital to have uh, a hemorrhoidectomy. So a very routine operation, ASA1, no problems. So she's a little bit nervous. She's heard various stories about uh, operations and surgery and, and problems that can arise, but she's been reassured by the team that she's in good hands. So on the day she comes into the operating room and it's decided we can give her a, a saddle block. So she has a saddle block, uh, seems to work. She lies on her front um, and then the surgeon starts. Then they quickly realize that actually 
the settle block is not working as well as possible. So the, the anesthetist, the anesthesia provider who's there with a student uh, decides to uh, add a bit of intravenous anesthesia to help with the pain relief. So she gets a syringe, gives a bolus of the drug, and then uh, walks out to go to, the, the, go to the bathroom. So it's not until a few minutes later that the surgeon recognizes that the blood is starting to look dark. Uh, and then of course, uh, they realize there's a problem. Uh, and so the patient is realized then that the patient's not breathing, turn the patient over on their back, and they start CPR. Uh, they continue CPR for about 20 minutes, but unfortunately the patient doesn't make it. So I'm telling you that story for uh, a, a good reason. And one of the, the, the main reasons is because a lot of the aspects of care in that case, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time discussing it now, it's a, it is a real case. A lot of the aspects in that case uh, can be prevented by the use of the standards that we're going to go on to discuss. Hippocrates stated, uh, first do no harm. Uh, and I think we should always remember that as we go about our practice. So in the UK, as an example, if you're a healthy patient who's having uh, elective surgery, uh, death during a general anaesthetic is very rare. We, we don't know exactly, but it's around one in 100,000 general anaesthetics. Uh, so then in comparison, uh, and this is just one of the many comparisons, um, maternal mortality after cesarean sections 50 times higher in low income settings compared to that of high income countries. And that data has come from the, the African Surgical Outcomes study. So we can see the safety during anesthesia. Now, I also think it's important for us to talk a little bit about um, the standard with these standards, whether they're appropriate, whether they're uh, applicable about the standards. I want us to think about three things, policy, guidelines, and standards, and they're different. So policy is a bit like a statement of intent. Okay, it's a set of ideas, a high level uh, plan that incorporates some beliefs or some objectives, but it doesn't give much detail and it often focuses on the results rather than the implementation. Then within that, standards or guidelines can provide more detail. Guidelines are, are more of a, a recommendation and particularly within medicine, uh, we have some very good guidelines where the authors, often a team of authors, will look at the available evidence and they will assimilate it, uh, join it all together, and write a guide about what they think, a consensus statement about what they think is best practice. Guidelines are not mandatory, they're not intended as standards, uh, and you can use your clinical judgment uh, within them. If we then think about standards themselves, a standard uh, is a level of quality or achievement, and they dictate a minimum acceptable or excellent levels of performance. And so that allows us to benchmark uh, among different facilities, different providers, different countries over time. And in this case, uh, really the standards are a measure of patient safety. So ideally standards should be both desirable and achievable. They should be patient-centered um, and promote the best possible outcome and also minimize exposure to the risk of harm. In fact, in my mind, it's really all about safety. We've just had uh, World Patient Safety Day for this, this year. Safety is becoming uh, much closer to the forefront of many people's minds. Um, this, I hope all of you recognize the picture of Ginger Bridge that I've, uh, I've borrowed the bridge that was lit up for World Patient Safety Day. And of course, there are many patient safety initiatives uh, around the world. But to me, patient safety is the most important aspect of patient care. And so if our standards are not about patient safety, 
then you could question whether they have any real value. So let me talk a little bit about the controversy uh, related to this. So this, the standards, and I'll talk about the history of these standards in a moment, but uh, the previous iteration published in 2010 um, resulted in some uh, difficulties that were written discussing whether the, the guidelines, those, sorry, those standards were unachievable in the majority of low and middle income countries. And I'm quoting, I'm quoting this uh, directly, influential international organizations have historically published anesthesia guidelines without leading to any change in outcomes. Just remember that, I'm gonna come back to that uh, in a moment. Um, but the, the paper was really proposing that we should be lowering the standards to make them more achievable in low and middle income countries. And an example of that was uh, what they categorized uh, as a, a, a health facility where you would give ketamine general anesthesia. And the point of particular contention for me was that they felt pulse oximetry was un unachievable in that setting. Um, and we wrote a letter to the journal in response to this article saying that uh, with a colleague from Lifebox. Um, and so it can, be, it can be a little bit contentious. But there's a, a professor, Adrian Gelb, from uh, UCSF, uh, University of California, San Francisco, and he, he said, and I completely agree, that really a failure to reach standards is not a failure of the standards themselves, but rather a failure of the individuals, the facilities, the managers, or the policy makers. So the question is how, how we translate standards into policy. How do we ensure that they're incorporated into practice? Um, and just because standards are difficult to believe, we shouldn't be trying to lower them. So international standards have, uh, have a real importance. And I promised I wouldn't mention COVID again, but um, previously there are many Ugandans who would travel for their healthcare. And I think the reason they would travel for their, for their healthcare outside the country is they perceive that the standard of care here in Uganda is not as good as the care that they would get in other countries. And so having international standards uh, allow a basic minimum level of care to be given globally. It's also a basic human right uh, and uh, the World Health uh, Assembly resolution um, now recognises that access to emergency and essential anaesthesia and surgical care is an integral part of universal health coverage and therefore it's also an integral hum basic human right. Uh, and it should be available to all patients, irrespective of their ability to pay. The standards uh, apply to anesthesia providers throughout the world, whether they're physicians or non-physicians, and regardless of their length or, or breadth of training. Now it's acknowledged, uh, and I, I do understand that the standards may be aspirational in some settings, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't use them because they can be used as a, a political tool. We can use them to advocate. Um, we can use them to help influence policy that's written. And this is also uh, another strange point, particularly in Uganda, but patients should feel able to demand uh, for care that meets basic standards. They have that right. So let's talk a little bit more about the standards themselves. The, the International Standards for Safe Practice of Anesthesia were first published in 1992. Um, then they were reviewed uh, over the coming years. In 2008, uh, the, the World Health Organization's Safe Surgery Saves Lives uh, program reviewed, revised and updated them. And in 2010, they were endorsed by all of the national anesthesia societies and published. As part of that publication, it was intended that they undergo regular review. Uh, and so in 2018, they uh, underwent their first substantive review. And one of the major differences during that review is that they were endorsed by the World Health Organization. Now, some of you may ask, 
why, what, what does the World Health Organization do? Why does that help us? Um, and of course, the WHO is part of the United Nations. It can't mandate what we do in Uganda. It can't mandate what uh, people do in other countries. But what the World Health Organization does is it gives access to the health ministries in all of the almost all of the countries around the world, 192 countries around the world. And that increases the visibility of the standards and it puts them on the desk of ministers of health in all of those countries around the world. So the standards are designed or intended to provide guidance and assistance to um, everybody who's involved in the provision of surgery and anesthesia from the anesthesia that providers themselves, their professional organizations, hospitals and facility administrators, and also governments to allow them to maintain and improve the quality and safety of, of anesthesia care. So before I go into more detail, I need to just talk a little bit about uh, the, the language that's used in these standards. So because the World Health Organization is unable to mandate, they use three levels, uh, highly recommended, recommended and suggested. So here, highly recommended is the functional equivalent of mandatory. Um, there's some confusion on which standards should apply where, and that partly comes from the different definitions of health facilities. So in Uganda, we follow the, the basic uh, definitions of the World Health Organization. And so you have your uh, health facility level one, where you can provide some surgical services. You then have your district hospital level two, and then your regional hospital um, or your tertiary hospital level three. But the Lancet Commission of Global Surgery, um, they, they define the different levels slightly differently. And so they have their prime, level one as primary healthcare ra rather than providing surgery. So I think it's important that we think of the types of surgeries that are done um, rather than thinking about the specific health facility itself. And so these standards are defined by what surgical cases are done in the health facility, regardless of whether the health facility is a regional hospital or a health centre four. And so in a health centre four, um, we use bellwether perhaps for uh, slightly the wrong, um, slightly, the, slightly the, the, the wrong reason. We're not saying that you should be doing uh, repairs of open fractures in health center fours, but it allows you to benchmark um, the ability of the surgical team, team to perform a range of emergency surgery. So in a health center four um, and a district hospital, we should be able to do a cesarean section. We should be able to do uh, an emergency laparotomy and a limited range of other surgeries. And in that uh, facility, at that level of health facility, the standards that are listed as highly recommended are the ones that should be uh, mandatory. If you move to the next level in a health facility where you do a wide range of emergency and elective procedures, and I, I've taken in Uganda a regional referral hospital to represent this, we should ideally be achieving the standards that are highly recommended and also recommended. And then if you do a full range of all emergency and elective procedures, we're looking at achieving the standards that are highly recommended recommended and suggested. So the standards themselves are grouped under the following headings, uh, professional aspects, facilities and equipment, medications and intravenous fluids, monitoring and con conduct of anesthesia. So if we think about the professional aspects to start with, um, I think the, the WFSA considered this a bit of a coup, but we have to, uh, we have to um, understand where they're coming from and see that anaesthesia services within a country uh, or more widely um, or, or at regional levels or local levels should be, if possible, be overseen or led by an anaesthesiologist. And this is highly recommended. 
But of course, they acknowledge that this is not always possible. And when there is no anesthesiologist available, which is a, a very common across Uganda, um, leadership can be provided by and should be provided by the most qualified individual. But perhaps more importantly, it doesn't matter who is caring for the patient. It doesn't matter whether the, whether the anesthesia provider is a physician anesthesiologist or a non-physician um, a medical officer with some training in anesthesia, an anesthetic assistant, it doesn't mean that your standards of safe safety vary. There's only one standard of safe safety. And therefore, uh, there should be guidelines and standards set locally and nationally that are consistent with the recommendations in this document. So I wonder whether we've uh, let ourselves down a little bit. Uh, so in, in our Bachelors of Science in Anesthesia curriculum, we understand the importance of safety. And in fact, it's at the very core of what we do. And there's a, there's a course unit uh, focusing specifically on the principles of safe anesthesia and the components of safe care that go with it. If we compare that with uh, the higher diploma in anesthesia curriculum that was rewritten a couple of years ago, if you search for safety in that document, uh, unfortunately, the only times you find it is related to health and safety and occupational safety. Uh, there's no mention of patient safety. Um, and that's something that perhaps we should be, as the leaders, be taking responsibility for and making sure that patient safety is incorporated into all of our training programs. So some of the other professional aspects within the safety standards, uh, professional training, there should be a formal training in a nationally accredited training program at a postgraduate level in all, uh, all countries that's highly recommended. And in addition, adequate resources, adequate time should be allocated to those people that are undergoing training. The number of anesthesia providers, it's highly recommended that we achieve the target of 20 specialists per 100,000 population. And those specialists are our obstetricians, our surgeon, surgeons and our anesthesiologists. And it doesn't uh, direct as to how many of those 20 should be anesthesia providers. Um, that's up to each, each national and regional level to decide, but we should be achieving the target. It's recommended that there are appropriate organisations to set standards of practice and supervision. Um, also that there should be the same organisations that are looking at continuing medical education and appraisals to ensure that uh, continuing practice um, is ongoing. Quality insurance is, is important. There should be an anonymous incident reporting system at a level where health facilities provide uh, most emergency and elective surgeries to allow continuous uh, analysis of anaesthetic practice, um, understanding where things go wrong and, and allowing you to improve what you do. And there should be a sufficient number of trained anaesthesia providers working at uh, each level and those anesthesia providers should be given time to uh, continue with their education, attend conferences, um, attend further studies as necessary. So the next section looks at uh, facilities and equipment and I've not listed that, that the, these uh, updated guidelines have a big list of all of the equipment that should be available in the facilities. But what I've done is I've just highlighted some of the uh, particular equipment that I often see as a challenge in some of the health facilities. So remember that highly recommended means really anywhere where we're doing surgery that involves uh, general anesthesia. And within this, we also are incorporating uh, moderate or deep sedation. I know from my personal experience, it's tricky sometimes to know exactly how much sedation to give somebody. And so you can easily 
end up with somebody with an anesthetic when you're planning with for, for deep sedation and often ketamine sedation really means um, ketamine general anesthesia and so uh, these standards these highly recommended standards should also apply when you're giving ketamine sedation that's either moderate or uh, deep sedation so the, some of the aspects that are often lacking which should be present oxygen supply a tilting operating table, intubation aids, suction, defibrillator, uh, pulse oximeter, non-invasive blood pressure monitor, and a carbon dioxide detector. So specifically the guidelines, uh, sorry, the standards talk about uh, carbon dioxide detection uh, during intubation. Um, and so if a facility can intubate patients, then they should have a means of detecting carbon dioxide um, to allow them to identify esophageal intubation uh, early uh, and but it doesn't necessarily mean that it should be continuous waveform capnography they apply that in the next level of health facility under their recommended standards so in addition to those that are required in the the lowest level in the second level the standards that are recommended include some kind of system for delivering inhalational anesthesia and that can be a plenum machine or a draw over machine. Um, and then particularly the monitoring changes a little bit. Continuous waveform capnography, ECG, temperature monitoring. And if you use uh, muscle relaxants, then you should have access to a peripheral nerve stimulator. I thought it was interesting to uh, look a little bit more about monitoring. So remember we said that suggested standards are those that apply at a national referral level. And so if you, um, if you work in, in Malago and in Kampala, some of the private hospitals, um, it'll be interesting to see whether you have access to all of these additional um, aspects of monitoring. Um, continuous measurement of inspired and expired gas volumes, um, inhaled anesthetic concentrations, and where appropriate, uh, invasive blood pressure monitoring um, and even processed EEG in, in uh, appropriate cases. So following on from monitoring, we also uh, look at uh, the category that's classed under conduct of anesthesia. So in terms of personnel, in a health facility where standards are recommended, so that's a class really as a, a regional referral hospital at least, possibly even a district hospital, a trained assistant should be available. And in addition to an anaesthetic provider, a trained anaesthetic provider um, should be available for each patient undergoing anaesthesia and they should be present in the room for the whole case. There should be a, a detailed pre-op uh, assessment done uh, identifying any uh, past medical problems. Um, it should be ideally documented in the patient's file and include consent. And con con consent can be uh, whatever form your health facility uh, dictates it should be, but preferably it should be written consent for anaesthesia. All facilities should be using the WHO safe surgery checklist. Um, of course, it can be modified if necessary, but it should be used. Anesthesia records, including your pre-op, intraoperative and post-op um, events should be documented clearly in the files. Post-anesthesia care is often a challenge, but there should be a specifically designated recovery area with uh, oxygen suction, means of ventilation and resuscitation drugs available in case they're needed. When we transfer care from the anaesthesia provider to uh, another member of staff, another caregiver, all of the relevant information about that patient, including any medical history, um, including what medications they've been given, any post-operative uh, instructions should be transferred. And lastly, pain management is incorporated in here to uh, ensure that all patients get as much or as close to adequate pain relief as is possible. Sometimes it's challenging, but all patients are entitled to uh, an anesthesia provider making every effort to prevent or alleviate their pain. And I would argue that that is also a basic 
human rights. So I'm just going to, um, as I come towards the end, I'm going to just highlight uh, what are the mandatory minimum uh, standards. And so these are the standards that should really be uh, adhered to in every health facility in the country. So there should be a trained anesthesia provider. They should be using a surgical safety checklist with availability of oxygen. There should be continuous pulse oximetry, both in the operating room and uh, in recovery in the post anesthesia care unit afterwards. There should be the ability to detect CO2 in places where intubation takes place. Uh, they should have, these facilities should have access to all of the World Health Organization essential medicines. They should be able to uh, display the heart rate, the pulse rate, or either by, uh, with a pulse oximeter or using palpation. They should be able to look at tissue perfusion by clinical exam. There should be non-invasive blood pressure monitoring and there should be adequate pain management. So my last slide hopefully will lead on to a little bit of discussion. Um, and I want to open up uh, to the, the, the audience and see whether you think these highly recommended standards are achievable in every operating room in Uganda. And also to ask uh, for some consensus whether it's the role of AAU to create a national document outlining safe standards in anesthesia um, something that we can use to advocate for patient safety. Uh, remember that patient safety is the most important aspect um, of a patient's care. And so um, if we are not able to use these standards to our advantage to improve the safety of anesthesia prophylaxis in Uganda, then they, they have little value for us. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam, for that very extensive presentation. I personally learned very, very many things. Um, some of the things I can summarize from it, at least we learned the differences between standards, policies, and guidelines. And I hope um, everyone took note of those. Um, and one thing we can say is there's one standard, irrespective of the fact that we have so many different anesthesia providers. And as we prepare to discuss whether it is actually the role of, IC, of AAU to create that national standard, some of the things I will try and summarize or point out are, he talked about the different aspects of the standards and uh, when he talked about the professional aspects, he reported something about he reported something about anonymous incident reporting. By show of hands, I want to I would like to ask how many of us try and do some form of anonymous incident reporting, either with our friends or with our seniors when we have a near miss. I'll just wait and in the chat section if anyone can report or is there a way as as anesthesia providers we can come up with a software or i don't know some some form of library that we can use to report our near misses or our incidents um anonymously so that we can provide better care to our patients Anyone with a suggestion on what we can do? And feel free to send in any questions that you might have regarding patient safety and the standards or the, and the guidelines as well as standards for us as, a, us as anesthesia providers.
Rachel, can I ask, uh, can I start off by asking a question uh, to some of the lecturers in the other, other universities in Macquarie and Umbrara? Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't uh, look at the MMED curriculums. You might be even be able to answer this yourself. Um, I'd be interested to know how much emphasis is placed on patient safety um, in the MMED curriculums and whether it's discussed um, and the importance of it is understood by all of our um, new graduates who come out. Okay, we'll start from those from my career. Mary? Hi everyone, um, forgive the noise in my background, but um, let's see, safety, safety as, a, as, a, as an issue is sort of highlighted in one of the, well for one, when the residents come in as, as, as year one residents, one of the things that uh, we do is we have an orientation week and during this uh, orientation week uh, one of the things that is emphasized is um, is uh, well safety of anesthesia how to manage emergencies and common problems that happen in anesthesia however uh, okay not however another thing another aspect of, of anesthesia safety comes up uh, in one of the course units during the first year, uh, first semester. There's a course unit called anesthesia and life support skills. And during this course unit, there's a big emphasis on safety, although it is not clearly, you know, highlighted as this is about patient safety, but the gist of of that course unit is such that if you don't pass it, if you don't pass that course unit, it really doesn't matter if you've passed everything else. It's one of those do or die course units. So it's that important. Uh, and I guess in, in a sense, that's how much, that's how much uh, value, that's how much it weighs um, when it comes to you know, to an individual's training. Well, uh, that's it. That's all I have to say. There is no lecturer from Mbarra here. <laughs> but I uh, thank you, Mary. I can answer uh, uh, basing on my experience as a resident. So, at the beginning, from the time you join the course, they at least will have will be taught about the emergencies and how to to go about the incidences. But then, at, in the final semester of the final year, there's there's one of the tutorials that basically just looks at, or a group of tutorials that basically just looks at only safety. But it's usually when you're doing it, it's, it's a build up of what you've been doing over the semesters and you sort of have look at safety in different aspects, whether it comes to a case, whether it comes to um, a way a procedure is done, whether it comes to management of the machines. I feel like it's, it's spread out across because when you look at the machines themselves, uh, if you have, when you talked about equipment, a patient, a bed that tilts, Though we can count the number of beds that tilt in some of our facilities, but a bed that tilts, having a professional around, having the monitoring equipment, having oxygen delivery, all those things are sort of um, um, highlighted, just that they're not probably, we don't use the word safety until some point in third year we're calling it safety, but it's, it's throughout the course, that's what I would say. Um, for my training or for what we have in Imbara. For some of the things that to do with monitoring, um, we don't we don't have some of those things. Yeah, that's that's what I would answer, what I would say. 
Thank you. Okay, there are some questions I'm sending out. Um, please feel free to give um, any to give to to send in your responses and any other questions and answers are very welcome. And as we wait, Adam had sent Nation. out a question. Yes. Adam said something about um, whether the Association of Anesthesiologists of Uganda yeah. has a responsibility and the role, what's the role of AAU if not to set the standards in the country? So I think that's a very valid question and uh, indeed AAU should should uh, put out these documents, should put out a document to set the standard of anesthesia in this country. And just because, as you said, just because we don't have the standards in place, we should lower our standards. We should aspire, you know, to attain the set standard. uh the basic the bare minimum we need to do we would want to be treated and we should hope for this um uh, yeah so yes adam i will use this forum to encourage people <laughs> to volunteer to help with these guidelines uh, there are a few teams that have already been put up and individuals and within their teams are working on on coming up with guidelines for uganda so I'd like to encourage anyone who's, who's interested in contributing to this, that yes, we should take up this and just because you're still in training or you just came out of training and you've only recently qualified doesn't mean you don't have anything to contribute. Each one of us has a role to play in anesthesia in this country and we need to own it. We are too few, but we need to be the leaders. Uh, so yeah. So. So it's important that we all, it's important that we all, you know, participate and take part. Yeah. Adam, I hope you have an... Thanks, Mary. I'll just shoot some of a few comments that uh, have been posted. Okay. Arthur says they have enough capnography. We shall come and borrow from your facility. And then Mary just says to get to know where we are concerning the standards, we would probably do a survey in all these regional referral hospitals or the facilities so that we see where we are. And then we can use that as a baseline um to probably draw our own standards i don't know if anything has has been done um or if aau has some of that information that we don't know May, mary do we have anything like that i don't I might know about this i wish fred bulamba was on this meeting as well but mm -hmm. a few years ago uh a few years ago in this country. So it's out, it's somewhere. It's just not published yet. Mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit of data. They collected data on, on, on the workforce, on the uh, anesthesia providers. They collected data on facilities and the equipment mm -hmm. that they have. So I think we do have that information. We just need to publish it somewhere publish it. and get it. Um, Put out somewhere. However, there is old information. Dr. Mijumbi, uh, Sarah Hodges, and a bunch of other people uh, published a paper some some time back, so many years okay. ago. I can't remember which year, but it had uh, some information on on the on the status, the state of anesthesia in this country. So something okay. now would definitely be good because then it would give us an idea. Mary? 
Okay, I think our network is breaking, so we can't hear what you said, but I guess if we got that information, we would be able to know where exactly we are. Of how we are faring. And okay. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, then regarding the incidents and the near misses, um, someone is talking of the forms that are printed and kept in theater. Um, I don't know. It's, it could work, but I'm, I, I, I don't know if, if, if we had something that we're now in, in sort of a tech edge, if, if technology edge, if we had something where someone would easily just feed it in from their phone, would it make any difference? Or would it make it faster instead of me having to go and look for a form and someone can see my handwriting and yet I am calling it a near miss or an incident? and it's reportedly anonymous, but if someone knows my handwriting, it's no longer anonymous. Um, do, do we have any comments on that? Apart from the formally, the forms that are printed, which I have not seen in my three years, is there a way we can create something that's like a software or an app where someone can fill in a near miss or an incident? Maybe as AAU and then spread it all to the to the other anesthesia providers hi i think everyone should just feel free to un unmute yourself yeah, eh? if you want to say something yeah. Unmute if you need to speak. Like. So, Rachel, thank you. Um, I think the idea of uh, some kind of uh, platform that you could easily access from your phone in order to report uh, incidents that occur would be is an excellent idea. Of course, we have a challenge of um, how many of these events are actually reported. So, in the anaesthetic form that we use in, uh, in Mbali. There's a small box at the bottom to write any extra information and we really try and encourage people to document uh, if there's some kind of uh, intraoperative event. But you've, you very, very rarely see anything written there, even when um, something clearly has, has happened. Um, so often, um, alongside uh, some kind of app or program like that, we also need to think, particularly when we're training, um, encourage a culture of openness and discussing okay. uh, these things it will help us to learn from them without placing blame of course there's still a quite a big culture of blaming people and if we can be very open um, then we can try and address that uh, while i'm while i'm also talking i can make a very brief comment in response to to mary and i, I agree i wish uh, fred was here to give us more information um, we we did well a survey was carried out uh, about 18 months ago or maybe a couple of years ago in quite a lot of health facilities it was supported with some funding from the Ministry of Health um, but after collecting the data I'm not quite sure what happened to it um, and I think there were some potentially some political issues so it's unlikely to be uh, published I think but uh, it, it's still useful information that we can access and use as a as an initial benchmark um, and see where we need to go uh, can I say something? Yeah. Adam, my hope is even if we don't publish it, you know, for the whole world to see, just for us locally to make use of or to see where we, we are um, in terms of anesthesia and what's in all these facilities out there. Uh, Adam, I don't know if he's going to respond to that. David, David there's a, a hand. There's some raised yeah. hands in there. Yeah. I can respond just by saying I agree. 
<laughs> David, please unmute yourself. I'm failing to unmute you. He's well as... Just go ahead and speak, David. Just speak. Hello? Yes. Yes, Rachel. Uh, I want to thank everyone who is on this platform, and uh, I'm happy that uh, we are able at least to get uh, new guidelines if it is to be. Uh, but my point here, as Adam has asked, is their role of AAU to create a national document outlining safe. To me, I would say this thing would have been done yesterday, not even today. I know the numbers are few, but uh, we are working under that condition. So we should have a standard that all of us is able to go by. Hello? Yes, thank you very much, David. Yeah, thank you, you're welcome. Okay. Someone has pointed out that if we actually set those standards, we're going to close up some facilities so the question goes to us, um, are we willing to close those facilities so that we have one standard and not fail the standard by, and not be failures because of wanting to go below the set standard? Ada? I think I can answer that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard, isn't it? In an ideal world, you would refuse to give an anesthetic if you don't have your, your patient monitor working. But the reality, of course, is that uh, a lot of our workload, certainly outside uh, Kampala, is emergency surgery. And so um, you can give a safe anesthetic without some of these things. Um, but of course, your safety improves when you have access to more of the uh, more of the monitoring and, and, and that other aspects and so i think somebody who's doing elective hernia repairs uh, in a health facility where there's no oxygen uh, there's no no pulse oximeter is probably doing the wrong thing but somebody who's doing an emergency cesarean section in order to save a baby or a mother's life uh, can be doing that accepting that there are some risks involved but acceptable in that situation so there's never uh, one there's never one easy answer um, in Bali we have uh, almost threatened to down our tools when we've had some challenges with numbers of staffing and things but um, it, it's a very difficult uh, it's a very difficult thing to do um, to close your theatre completely especially when you know that a lot of these things take a long time to come, but we should still be advocating for them. Rachel, can I say something? Yes. Thank you, Adam. Um, I just want to say, I want to put it out there that just because we do not have a national standard yet, does not mean we've been moving around like headless chickens. Uh, there's a reason why WFSA uh, attempted or uh, ensured that they aligned themselves with WHO, as, as Adam put it out there. But everyone knows, well, maybe not everyone, but um, during, during the training of anesthesia, during the anesthesia training, um, I don't know, someone needs to mute themselves. During training in anesthesia, uh, one of the things that we, that, you know, usually comes up is what is the AAGBI standard, recommended standard of, of monitoring, what are the recommended standards. So even if we don't have an, an, an anesthesia guideline I, with a name, say, Uganda anesthesia guideline, there are recognized guidelines out there. So if someone's is in a, someone is in a facility somewhere and they're using this excuse that Uganda has no guidelines, that's
Mary, the kind of talk is playing games. Okay, as we wait for her to get on board, we can. As we wait for her to get on board, there's just one question as we plan to close. Um, someone is wondering whether we can do this without Ministry of Health funding. I don't know how possible that is. I think we lost Mary. So I don't know if Adam will answer that for us. How possible is it for us to, to, to sort of do another survey, but without Ministry of Health funding, so that it's just us doing it? Thanks, Rachel. Um... So it's definitely possible. Um, it's a good idea. Uh, I just don't quite understand the politics that went on. Um, and so if you, do a if you do a big national survey, then we would need permission from the Ministry of Health before we did it. Of course, you'd need ethical approval and then you would need, um, as part of that, yeah, a letter because from it's, the Ministry of Health. Um, but it's definitely something that uh, can be done. Um, and I would, I am mm -hmm. not going to lead it, but I would be perfectly happy to support anybody um, who is interested in trying to do that. And I'm sure we could get some funding from somewhere for a project like that. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Adam. I don't know if any other people have questions or any comments, feel free to unmute yourself and um, give your input. But I, I, as we summarize, thank you very, very much, Adam, for that extensive um, presentation. It was, it was very, very detailed, um, and we appreciate that. And I believe everyone who has um, logged in this evening, or jo who has joined this webinar, has surely picked something and, and at least there's a standard they've picked that they're going to to take on with them and I'm hoping everyone will have all these standards at the back of their mind so that if everyone is going with one standard then eventually everyone will eventually will have almost the same standard everywhere. Um, if we don't have any other questions. Rachel, could I just, uh, I just want to come in with one last, uh, one last point that I've just thought of. So uh, it's okay. in, yes. uh, in this region of Uganda, I often get uh, calls from my anaesthetic officer colleagues who work in some of the more rural health center fours and district hospitals who have challenges with uh, monitoring and access to the monitoring. And so the providers themselves know what they need and, and want it, but there's a real challenge uh, persuading the, the DHOs or, or the health facility managers how important it is and so really I'm just asking everybody who's here and all of us as anesthesiologists and as leaders to support our um, colleagues everywhere to try and achieve these standards. Yeah.